All right. Um, the government is on a collision course with the Treaty of White or the Waitangi Tribunal or the Waitangi Tribunal is on a collision course with the government. It depends which way you look at it. Over a summons that they have put, or at least the tribunal has put, um, in front of the Minister for Children, Karen Chua. Now, Karen Chua, um, we've had her on the show before, we've talked about her background, and she was, in many ways, uh, the perfect person to be the Minister for Children. Um, and, and as she announced as one of her overlays, that she wanted um, essentially some equity and fairness and saw Section 7AA of the Oranga Tamariki Act as perhaps impeding that. Just to explain, 7AA relates to the duties of the Chief Executive in relation to the Treaty of Waitangi. And essentially, uh, the Chief Executive is obliged um, to A, provide a practical commitment to the principles of the Treaty of Waitangi, whatever they might be, uh, but also to ensure that the policies and practices of the Department that impact on the well-being of children and young persons have the objective of reducing disparities by setting measurable incomes for Maori children and young persons who come to the attention of the Department, and also that the policies, practices and services of the Department have regard to mana tamaiti for tamariki and the whakapapa of Maori children and young persons and the whanau tanga or responsibilities of their whanau, hapu and iwi. Um, and it goes on to say some other things as well. The key thing here is that Maori children are to be treated differently uh, in the way in which they are um, approached by uh, the Ministry for Children, Te Oranga Tamariki, um, and that that is to be revoked and repealed by the government. It's been announced in the coalition agreement. Uh, they got announced on it. It's a matter, I think, of quite clear um, pre-election policy by at least two of the parties. Um, and you would think, well, that's democracy underway. Not so, say the treaty, or so the Waitangi Tribunal. Joining us to talk about this, somebody who's uh, not only a particular interest in constitutional law of this matters, but has an insight as to what is likely to happen next, is Wellington lawyer Graeman Edgela, and he joins us this morning. Graham, thank you so much for taking some time out of your schedule to join us. Happy to be here. Graham, can I ask a question just before I start? I was in the uh, court myself in a civil matter on Monday, which I'll explain to listeners a little bit later on. Um, and I was trying, some, a lawyer came and said, um, after the, uh, from the other side, came over and said, oh, you know, um, how much was potentially costing her client um, for, to represent him um, as a reason why I should settle. Um, but Graham, do lawyers charge by the eight minutes or the 12 minutes these days? Is it, they have, is, you've got some sort of arcane or uh, quite, quite, Clear system I thought the of charging. Uh, certainly not a practice I do. My understanding of the practice was the six minutes. Oh, but, six minutes. Um, I don't actually know. Um, yeah, so when you go to the toilet, so when you go to the toilet, you, you can't, you're not charging anybody for that, are you? I, I don't do time-based charging. It's oh, too annoying to, to record. It is. To be I would have thought so too. Yeah, no, I would have thought so too. I've, I've I think you need, you basically, I think it is, you just need practice. And if you start doing it for a couple of years when you're a junior lawyer in some faceless big firm or something like that, you get very good at it. And um, it's probably not that hard. I just never did. No, good on you. No, it makes much more... Uh, uh, it's a bizarre system, but thank you very much. Okay, um, I've, I think I've just tried to explain all that. Can I ask yeah. a question of you as somebody who's interested in, uh, interested in constitutional law. Can the Waitangi Tribunal compel a Minister of the Crown to appear before it and explain their actions as pretty much has happened in this case? I think the answer is yes. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the Waitangi Tribunal is set up as we, a permanent commission of inquiry. We've seen commission of inquiries before, you know, uh, you know, we had one in for uh, White Island and you had one for the Christchurch earthquake and you had one for the terror attack. You know, commission of inquiries, sometimes called the Royal Commission, they have the same powers. Waitangi Tribunal is set up as a permanent commission of inquiry. So it basically does the same things as those do. And um, we didn't see it in public, but various ministers gave evidence to the the, uh, the Christchurch Terror Attack uh, Commission of Inquiry and this, the same here. I mean, it's the practice they wouldn't normally need to compel it because I think what would usually happen is the minister or someone in the ministry would just give a written statement which recorded everything and that would be enough. It's just sort of particularly, you know, the way the decision has been made in this case, the decision was much more personal to the minister in this case 
than is normal. You know, normally it's, you know, the ministry recommends and here are your options and they go through the paper and prepare a whole lot of things and so someone in the ministry could normally provide that information. The difference is here the way the decision has been made. Decision has been made much more closely by the minister with perhaps less involvement from the ministry than would normally happen in sort of government decision making. And so it's meant that the, uh, the information that the ministry has been able to provide hasn't been as much as would normally be the case. And they say, oh, Minister, could you provide this information? Uh, what might normally happen is the Minister would say, sure, here's a written statement. Um, the Minister hasn't wanted to do that, and so the next step is if the, if the Waitangi Tribunal does want some of this information, um, it's got the power of summons just like courts have and commissions of inquiry have, because it is a commission of inquiry. So that's... Uh, uh I'm looking at the jurisdiction of the tribunal to consider proposed legislation, which obviously this is this is section eight of the um, and you will have seen it too, Graham, of of the of the bill. I don't see anything there that says that it has the 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 ability to compel witnesses to appear in front of it. Are you saying that that exists in some other piece of legislation somewhere? Uh, I can't remember if it's in the Treaty of Waitangi Act or, or the Commission of Inquiry Act, but the, the Waitangi Tribunal is a, is a Commission of Inquiry, and the Inquiries Act certainly gives Commissions of Inquiry the pal- power to compel witnesses, um, and basically in the same way that courts can compel witnesses. Okay. You know, if, the, if the court thinks you're going to have relevant evidence for it, you know, if you don't want to turn up, if you don't want to turn up, the court can say, here's a summons, you have to turn up, and then you do. Well, and that's the position we're on at the moment. Now, obviously, yes. um, uh, the government have said, no, we're not going to do that. And Crown Law says that Karen Shaw won't be appearing or giving a written evidence. Um, what happens next? Well, I think what Crown Law has said is that they're going to challenge the summons, which is something you can do if someone, particularly a sort of a lower court, issues a summons, which this effectively is. It's a, a court that you can sort of sue in the high court. It's what's called sort of an inferior tribunal or something like that. Um, you can challenge a summons by applying to the high court to set it aside. Um, mm-hmm. And so they've said they're going to do that. Um, if the high court refuses to set it aside, I would very much imagine that Karen Shaw will be turning up um, because if she doesn't, you know, there are consequences that follow from you know, failing to comply with summonses. Okay, so um, it goes to court, it goes to the High Court, for some strange reason it'll have some sort of precedence over a whole series of backlog stuff already, but it goes there anyhow, I don't know why it would be have some urgency. Is that because the legislation will be passed before, if it was just to go into the, the normal The reason process? it would go quickly to the High Court is that the summons says, please give evidence on this date. Right. Yeah. And you know, you can negotiate the date if you want, but if you get a final date, it's like, here's a summons, turn up at court on the 14th of June, and if you don't turn up at the 14th of June, you've broken the law and <laughs> you could be prosecuted. So you get urgency for sort of the, the initial steps of something like this because this, there's a summons that exists and has been served on someone that says they have to do something by a particular date. If you don't okay. get that summons thrown out before then, you, you have to do it or you're running some risks. Crown Law have argued that, quote, the move contravenes constitutional principles and that the repeal was a political decision not based on empirical evidence. Um, what constitutional principles would they be talking about? I think the main one they're talking about is the basic idea that what Cabinet discusses is private. You know, so you shouldn't be able to compel someone to discuss, disclose something, cabinet discussions. You know, cabinet can have all the sorts of disagreements they like when they're there, but once they get out of cabinet, that's the government's decision and every member says, every cabinet member says, you know, that's the decision of cabinet and it's my job to support it. Um, I think that Crown Law is probably pushing slightly too, too far on this. I, I think... That's probably a good argument as why Karen Shaw should be able to refuse to answer certain questions. So if she turns up and says, okay, I am going to give evidence, ask me what you like, answer some questions, but at one point they might ask, someone might ask a question, and then she could say, at that point, I think, no, if I was to answer that question, um, it would you know, breach cabinet confidentiality, and so I declined to answer. And But I think it is a question-by-question question analysis, not just a, can she give any evidence or no evidence or everything, I think it's, you know, a lot of the stuff the tribunal or the claimants might want to ask might be things that they could ask about 
And some of them will be the type of thing that the Crown is concerned about and saying, well, that's a cabinet discussion. Those are confidential. And, but I think they should, should be objecting to particular questions at the time of the evidence, not to turning up at all. Okay. If Crown Law lose, though, at the High Court and they want to dig their head, um, heels in and the government insists that they do so, then we go through, and it's, it's an interesting argument, um, should the tribunal ever be able to compel elected people to appear before it when they've made a political decision and try and justify it to them. But as you say, apparently this is in their Commission of Inquiry rules and they can inquire into any legislation if they think it breaches treaty principles. Um, yeah, well, in, I think once, the the bill is, once the bill is actually introduced, so if the bill is going through Parliament which it hasn't yet, yeah, they're talking about it, but it has not get to the Scotland, get yet reached the stage where the bill has gotten into Parliament, you know, been introduced, first reading and all those sorts of things. Yeah. If that happens, um, then the Waitangi Tribunal will step aside and say, okay, now this is for Parliament now. Oh, really? Um, so you're saying that if they introduce the bill next week, then the tribunal would have to stand down? Yes. Oh wow! Why I don't they do so. that? Like it, ha it happened on. It happened on one. There was a, there was a, a request for a tribunal hearing into one of the. I can't remember exactly what the decision was. Now that you've asked about it, one of the earlier things, maybe one of the RMA decisions or Three Waters or something like that. I think the Three Waters. The yeah. government was just. We were appealing Three Waters tomorrow, and the tribunal said we want to look at that. And the government introduced the bill, and the tribunal stopped. 